Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to mention that we have established a rating system where you can rate all the sessions on ITB convention. You will find it in the app that you may download for Android and iOS. And if you click the specific session, then you can rate it. And we were happy if you do so with, uh, for the next few sessions today and the uh, next days. Ladies and gentlemen, we are currently experiencing a phase in which the world order seems to be coming apart at the seams. I already mentioned it. The number of regional hotspots is increasing dramatically, conflicts are escalating, globalization is faltering, and terror attacks are unnerving people everywhere. Old certainties are no longer valid anymore. The stability of the current world order is becoming more and more doubtful. In an era of world disorder, the tourism industry is undergoing massive changes. What is the current geopolitical situation? Where are the most difficult hotspots? Which developments, both positive and negative, are emerging? How can some type of reliable order be restored? Ladies and gentlemen, before we start our first keynote today, let's test our real-time voting system with the first question we would like to answer. Can we have it on screen, please? Our first real-time voting question. It is, the world order appears to be coming apart at the seams. What is the impact on the global tourism industry? Please ju just give one answer. Number one, a significant impact. Number two, no significant impact. Or number three, impact will stay the same. Please vote now with the remote control device that you have on your seats. Please press now. This is a clear vote. 75% say it has a significant impact. This shows us we have the right topics here on ITB convention. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited and very proud to welcome our first keynote speaker, Mr. John Christian Kornblum, senior counselor, NUR LLP, former US ambassador to Germany. John Kornblum is one of the leading experts on transatlantic economic and political affairs. He entered the American Foreign Service in 1964. Over the next 35 years, he served in Europe and at the State Department in Washington. During his Foreign Service career, Kornblum specialized in European and West East-West relationships and played a defining role in really many, many of the important events leading up to the end of the Cold War. He served as ambassador to Germany from 19 97 to 2001. Since leaving diplomatic service, Kornblum has pursued parallel career tracks in business, consulting, and political commentary in Europe and the United States. It's also worth mentioning that he received numerous awards during his professional career. He is known especially for his press and TV commentaries on the implications of globalization on both sides of the Atlantic. And today, he is our esteemed keynote speaker. Herr Kornblum, many thanks for being our keynote speaker at ITB this year. We can't imagine a better speaker for our first topic, the new era of world disorder, the multiplication of crisis. Mr. Kornblum, we are excited to listen to your keynote. Herzlich willkommen. Danke, danke. Thank you very much, Professor Conradi, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, very important event. It shows how much change has already taken place if I tell you that I used to be very active in the ITB 30 years ago 
when Berlin was a divided city, and when having this lifeline to the outside world through the ITB was not simply an interesting cultural experience or a business experience, it was in fact a matter of survival for the western sectors of Berlin. Now today, 30 years later, <clears throat> this remains the largest tourist uh, convention in the world, but Berlin has now come to have a totally different role in the world. It is now the center of a rapidly growing integrated Europe and integrated world, and it demonstrates through its role, but also through the events which affect Berlin, how big the changes are that Professor Conradi talked about. And in fact, I, I read through your program this morning and I can see that most of the subjects you have on your future day today are the subjects that I want to talk about today too. Because I think it is true that things are changing very rapidly, but it is also true that we shouldn't panic about it. And especially for the tourism and travel industry, it's important that one understand how possible it is to live in this world and how important it is that you continue to do just what you've been doing for so many years. Um, this is a major challenge, however, and so it, it will be important to change, and it will be important to understand how and why to change. I have structured my talk today in a, in a series of questions because I think the most important thing that we need today to do today is to understand which questions to ask. Very few of the answers are available. They are going to be worked out in the coming years, but if we have the right questions, I learned also in my diplomatic life, if you have the right questions, it's a lot easier to figure out the right answers. So my first question is, uh, in a way, a very simple one. Why is this all happening? Some of you may remember now it's 25 or so more years ago, an American professor wrote a book called The End of History. He was certain that the end of the Cold War would bring with it the victory of liberal democracy, of open borders, of open trade and uh, travel among people. This, by the way, this book was written, it shows you how fast change has been taking place. This book was written before the internet was invented. And he already saw a world coming ahead that was changing in a positive way, but he had no way of understanding what the digital revolution was going to be. And I think that that is part of the reason for the upheavals today. It is certainly not the end of history. History is galloping along at a faster pace than ever. But the fundamental changes that are taking place are coming first through the passage of time from the beginning of this current era, which is usually marked at the end of World War II, but also, of course, by the immense and massive and broad-reaching technological change that we're, under, uh, that we're experiencing. As early as 2004, that's now 13 years ago, the U.S. National Intelligence Council described digitalization as a so-called overarching mega trend, that's a big word in any language, a force so ubiquitous that it will sub sub substantially shape all events which take place by the year 2020. I think we can all say that this is true. But we can also see in most of our countries, be they in America, Europe, or in other parts of the world, that societies and politicians have not really adjusted to this change. And in fact, the foundation of our lives is more or less the same foundation which was established after World War II. It was a foundation based on a world that was tired of war, destroyed by war, and it was based on very clear rules which were set down in very clearly written treaties that everybody was supposed to obey. Now the fact is that this worked pretty well. And today we are living in a world, however many changes and however many crises seem to be there, we are living in a world which is more open, more democratic, and even more peaceful. That may sound like a strange thing for me to say, but if you look at the statistics put together by various institutions, 
you will find that there are fewer conflicts in the world today than there were 25 years ago, and even more fewer than there were 30 or 35 years ago. What that means is that the world is in fact evolving in a positive direction. I have no doubt about that. But it's evolving as it always does with ups and downs, with conflicts, with disagreements, and sometimes with horrible violence. And this is simply going too fast for our political systems. And that is not limited to one country. It's too fast for the political systems just about and everywhere around the world. Now, some of you may have heard that we had last fall an election in the United States, and we elected a new president. Uh, his name is Donald Trump, uh, a German-American, I may add, for this audience. Uh, just in case the Germans wanted to make sure where he learned all of his tricks. Um, and Mr. Trump is not a politician at all, but what he is and has been for many years is a master of popular culture. And I think it's important to, to, to for also for your industry to understand that much of the trends and much of the uh, behavior that we're seeing these days is not being instituted by famous universities or commentators, it's coming from popular culture. And of course, if, if there is an industry which is more attuned to popular culture and influenced by popular culture than the, the travel and hospitality industry, I'm not sure which one it is. But Mr. Trump learned over years also through his reality television appearances how to measure and how to feel popular culture. And when we recall his very close and very controversial election victory over Hillary Clinton, we shouldn't forget that in the primaries, the elections within the party that preceded the presidential election, Mr. Trump beat 17 other Republican candidates, 17. And these people were truly a reflection of their part of America. There were very liberal people there, very conservative people there. There were old people, young people, women, Afro-Americans, Hispanics. It was, in fact, a picture of America at that time, and he beat every single one of them. He seemed to sense that Americans were being overwhelmed by too much change. We had elected an African-American president, which I considered to be one of the most positive historical developments in the history of our country. But for many people, it wasn't so positive. We have to be honest about it. Many people were not happy about the legalization of marijuana or the legalization of gay marriage or the fact that the immigrants coming to our country were 90% not from Europe anymore, but from Asia, South America, Indian subcontinent. In other words, there was a great sense of not just dissatisfaction in the society, but in many ways a, a sense that globalization was changing their lives in ways they didn't want to have it changed. Old industries were disappearing. Uh, new industries were coming that people didn't quite understand. Trump's opponent was Hillary Clinton, one of the most honorable politicians, I use this word, politicians in the American recent American history, but she contrasted negatively with Mr. Trump's message because she was delivering the standard political message which had been used in America for 50 or more years, 60 years before this election. She couldn't meet his insults, his charges, she couldn't meet the excitement that he generated and even though, as we know, his personal behavior is not exactly what you would wish to have from your son or son-in-law, um, he beat her because he, he generated among a very strong base of people support for his idea that globalization was ruining our country, period. That's what it was all about. This is something which is happening in Europe now. There are gonna be several elections this spring in Europe. But it's going on in other parts of the world too. And so for, for your industry, who in fact work everywhere in the world, who send people everywhere in the world, understanding what is going on under the surface, 
what this, in fact, change means and the things I've looked at your program, you have all of the subjects this morning which I think are important to understanding this. But I think it is important to understand that the foundation is not ideological. It's not racial or religious, even though some countries in the Muslim world are very strongly active right now. The, the, the reason for their change is not religious there either. It is much more simply a fact that we are going through a sea change in society. In Germany, you would call it a Zeitenwechsel and that this is not going to stop. In other words, it's important to understand it and live with it. My second question, what then will this future look like? At the moment, it's going to be more of the same. The momentum of change is growing every year. The late Alvin Toffler, who was one of the first futurists in the United States, over 40 years ago, he started writing his books, in his classic work called Future Shock, he pointed out that too much change overloads us psychologically, affects our decision making, weakens our ability to act rationally, and essentially puts society into a very difficult situation. Some of this may remind you of the tourists who you bring along. They rarely act rationally, and this is my opinion anyway. But it's now spread beyond tourists to m many Western and world leaders. In many ways, our leadership itself is suffering from a, what we call a post-traumatic shock disorder. That is, confusion after a very big shock. And I'm afraid that this shock will not end very soon. Francois-Henri Pinot, who is the CEO of the PPR Group, which you may know is one of the great luxury goods uh, producers of the world, wrote a few years ago, we are at the, we are entering an age of irrationality. We are at the beginning of a social trend and a change in values which will go on for years. And we shouldn't be surprised. After all, the age of rationality lasted for nearly 200 years. So his view, we are, we are leaving the age of rationality. And if you think of some of the words that are now used in press and have been chosen as the words of the year, such as post-factual age, or false news, or um, uh, hacking, et cetera, et cetera, you can see that a sense of, at, at a minimum, subject, subjectivity, but perhaps even irrationality, is starting to, to dominate our political life. A very difficult thing to accept, but a thing that one has to learn to deal with. Donald Trump grew famous as an audacious, intolerant reality television host on a show called uh, The Apprentice. And he took candidates who thought they might want to work for the Trump organization and then essentially insulted them almost until they collapsed on stage. And everybody considered this funny. Uh, his most famous word became almost a national slogan, you're fired. And uh, he used it again and again and again and established in the minds of his viewers, and I suppose also in his own mind, a sense that simple solutions, simple dramatic solutions were better than long, reasonable discussion. And this suggests, as I said before, that as the post-war social order collapses, emotions will often replace reason. Political parties, we can see it already in Europe and the United States, will decline. Local patriotism will grow stronger. This is happening everywhere. Facts will be ignored, but interestingly enough, data, which after all contains the facts, will reign supreme. And the new elites of the future will not be, I hope I'm not uh, stepping on anyone's toes here, will not be the consultants, the classic people who will give you a 500 page study about uh, you know, how to redo your bathrooms in your company, Rather, it will be the people who know how to, as we say in English, crunch data. The people who know how to give you data about who travels where, under what conditions, what kind of airlines do they choose. 
These are going to be the new intellectual elites of the futures. Mr. Satya Nadella, a native of the Indian subcontinent who is now the head of Microsoft, said recently, during the next 10 years, we'll reach a point where nearly everything has been digitized. And I think that's probably true. With all of this data floating around, top-down management, the kind of management structures which were developed in the 19th century for the new industries, textiles and iron and steel and railroads, top-down management, be it in government or in industry, will no longer have a monopoly on wisdom. <clears throat> the authority chain, the organizational structure will become flat because in a digitized world, everybody has access to the same data. It's no longer just the company chiefs or their uh, deputies who have the data. Everybody has the data. Everybody can be an expert on everything. That doesn't mean that everybody will be right or even efficient. It means, however, that the authority of top management, and that includes people such as the President of the United States or the Chancellor of Germany, the authority of these people will decline. The uni unity of decision making, the unity of treatment, international treatment will change. And rather defining the future, which is we, what we've looked to government to do for us for more than a century, rather than defining the future, both government and business will scramble to keep up. Now again, I need not tell you that your industry has been shaken by a lot of these challenges for many years already. The, the, I notice you have a couple of, some, on, your, on your agenda you have a couple of discussions of terrorism, a very big issue, but also political instability, but also the rise and fall of new industries, the rise and fall of new countries, the technological leaps in communications, these are the foundations of both digitization and globalization, and they will affect your industry very dramatically. Only today we use new words such as global supply chains and integrated digital networks to describe a world which is the new world which is built, being built around us. I see no reason why this trend should change. No amount of anti-globalization sentiment in Europe or the United States and elsewhere is going to change this trend. If that's the case, then we come to my third question. Who are the winners and the losers in such a situation? And here is where the past and the future will collide. The Trumps and the Le Pens and the Brexit people are essentially people who are trying to stop change. They are getting their votes, their support, from people who feel cheated by globalization and want to stop it. But you, I think you've heard this message already from me, they cannot stop it. Increasingly, the, the well-being of countries will be based on changing political and economic alliances brought together by digital networks. The kind of make America great again message or the kind of France for the French that Ms. Le Pen is putting together simply will not work. And over the coming years, it will simply be ignored that the, the digital world will not allow Europe or America or India or Russia, for example, to shut themselves off from, from the world. As I've said before, but I'd like to emphasize it again, the arguments that you will be hearing in coming years will not always be logical or easy to understand. They will, in fact, seem to be very contradictory. And I'll give you one small example from a place that is very high, I know, on the tourism scale, the uh, Grand Duchy of Cornwall in England. I know that place well because my grandparents were born there, and I'm very proud of it. In recent years, it has become the Silicon Valley of the United Kingdom. Why is it the Silicon Valley of the United Kingdom? Because the EU gave subsidies of 250 million pounds to build one of the fastest high-speed digital networks in Europe, if not the world, in Cornwall. So when the Brexit referendum came up, 
one would have assumed that Cornwall would have been very much in favor of staying in the EU. Instead, they voted 65% to leave after the EU had turned them into the most modern economy in England. The same thing has happened in the United States. Parts of the country which have profited tremendously from the digital revolution have voted against the, uh, the parties who believe and voted for Mr. Trump. In other words, it's important to look beneath the surface and understand why these traditions are taking place. I grew up in the city of Detroit, Michigan, which itself once saw itself as one of the leaders in technology. The American automobile industry is having the best year in history right now and probably will continue to do so. But have any of you have ever been to Detroit? I'm not sure you send very many tourists there at the moment. It's one of the most dis destroyed cities in the United States. Why? Because of digitalization and globalization. The cars are still being made, but they're not being made there. And that city could not recover from the loss of the great industrial base that came with when the automobile factories moved out, and it is now truly a wasteland. I was just there a few months ago. In other words, power will flow, power in the world will be defined differently. It will flow to the nations which can best exploit best understand what's going on in, with digitalization and global supply chains. The small, small country of Estonia in, on the Baltic has become one of the digital powerhouses in the world. It has 1.1 million people, but it has an elite, a political elite, which understood that they had to live and learn to live with digitalization, and they're now really one of the most admired and most powerful digital countries on the world. In the future, our industry, our diplomacy, our politics will uh, be, be focused much more on who can manage the digital world and not so much on who says I'm the greatest or I'm going to make America great again or Putin's various messages. That's not going to happen. But at the same time, technology does not, and it will not for a long time, hopefully never, replace human beings. And here again for your industry, the key is going to be to merge all of this technology with the very fact of what you do is offer opportunities, offer excitement, offer relaxation, and you bring human beings from one place to another. And it's going to be both the countries and the industries who understand this who are going to be the winners of the future. Finally, What's going to happen next? First, it's important not to overreact. All of this does not represent the end of the world as we know it. Secondly, as I said earlier, the prospects for the world don't look bad at all. They look, in fact, quite positive. Economic growth is picking up, et cetera, et cetera. But the major problem is right now is we don't have a vocabulary to describe what's going on. It looks like chaos, and there's always reason in chaos, but it's hard now to describe it because we don't really know what to talk about. We're going to need to have a new kind of vocabulary. My candidate for this role focuses on one word in English, and it's, I think, translatable into most languages, is the word value and values. The industries which provide value will be those who succeed. And there's a very good example from the digital industry of what I mean. One of the pioneers in the digital industry was Yahoo. It faltered, not because it wasn't earning money, because for whatever reason, and it's far beyond my knowledge to know, it didn't provide value. Nobody wanted to buy its product anymore. And Yahoo was sold recently, is now part of, uh, I think, AT&T, or Verizon, one of the two, still earns money, but nobody believed in the value of the Yahoo brand. The same thing is going to happen also in the tourism industry. It's going to happen everywhere. In other words, it's not showing and being great and being exciting. It's also the value you provide. And the basis for doing this, I would say, is going to be values. In other words, we've, we really are leaving the world of ideology we are entering a world, as I said before, of, of data, of achievement, of value. 
But if there are no values to this world, if we don't know where we're going and why we're doing it, if we have no moral base, then it will end up being chaos. Because the connections, the possibility for interaction are so great that uh, if there isn't some kind of guiding light, it's going to be chaos. Now my view, I'm from the United States, I'm from a Western country, I believe that Western values are the best foundation for the values for the new world also. Why? Because they work. They provide openness, they provide opportunity, they provide justice, and above all, they provide an opportunity for progress. But there are other values in the world and they need to be debated. Barack Obama, one of the reasons that Mr. Trump won, I would argue, is that Barack Obama didn't take on this issue. He seemed to let digitalization in the background. And so in the end, we ended up with somebody who was an emotional op opponent of digitalization rather than a supporter. This, I, these, I think, are gonna be the challenges in the future to find value and values in a rapidly changing and very, very disturbing world. But again, my view is very strongly, we need not to be pessimistic. There have been many other challenges which have been met, and I think we're well on the way to meeting this one also. Thank you very much.